If you can't sense it, then you can't automate it. It's one of my mantras, and it's one of the most important parts of any smart home because it drives the accuracy, reliability, and a lot of the benefit of your smart home. So today, as I give you 50, 59 tips for smart home sensors, know that every one of these that you use will help you build bigger and better automations that everyone will love. I'm gonna roll up my sleeves so we can walk through some of the basics that are applicable with every one of the sensors you'll use today. Now, almost every sensor you purchase will use one of the big six wireless technologies. Zigbee, Z-Wave, Thread, Bluetooth Low Energy, Wi-Fi, or LoRa. One of these wireless technologies is not like the others. And in fact, I never recommend it for a battery powered sensor. That tech is Wi-Fi, as Wi-Fi networks have to test that each device is connected constantly, and this is a significant battery drain. Zigbee Z-Wave Bluetooth, Thread, and LoRa are all great for battery powered sensors because they are low power networks, which means often you'll have coin batteries that last for years. Now, LoRa products I own from Yolink often boast five years on the batteries provided which is incredible. On the topic of battery powered sensors, any battery powered sensor will start to fail with a low or an unstable voltage, which means that if you buy cheap batteries or they're just starting to get old, you might notice failures or misreports. So if you replace batteries in a sensor and it starts to mess up, get a better battery before blaming the hub the sensor or your dog. Your sensors will likely connect to a smart home hub and if they don't, they will probably suck. That smart home hub will be the basis of the network that keeps everything connected, including your sensors. The hub will keep a map of the network no matter which technology it uses and will send and receive signals from your sensors and other devices. Sometimes the signal from your hub won't reach your sensor though. And when this is the case, we do have a few options. If your hub has Z-Wave, LoRa, or Thread, those are longer range technologies and could be used instead of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth Low Energy, or Zigbee to improve distance. Each technology has a different carrier frequency, and the higher that frequency is, the more likely it'll be blocked by materials in your home. Also, some are 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which could be interfered with by your home's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or some of the other signals in your home. Metal and other reflective signals cause pain too, unless you use Z-Wave or LoRa, which have a lower carrier frequency than the others. Your third option is to add a repeater in Zigbee or Z-Wave networks, or additional border routers to a thread network. Of course, with Wi-Fi, you could create a mesh Wi-Fi network as well. Your sensor won't be a repeater in most cases because providing that function takes power, which is limited on a battery-based sensor. Instead, you will probably want a smart plug or a smart light switch that is stated to be a repeater or router for your mesh network. Today, the wireless technology named Thread has two incredible features that will make all of this much easier. Number one, Thread 1.3, which will come to many of the biggest hubs and smart speakers, changes Thread border routers to all work together in creating a network. This means an Apple HomePod Mini could work with Thread border routers from almost any manufacturer, like Amazon or Google, who will have Thread border routers and speakers as soon as the Matter standard is released. Number two, Thread has a much lower latency when the networks get larger. This is in comparison to Zigbee and Z-Wave, which are primarily used in smart home sensors today. So over time, as your home grows bigger, a Thread sensor is likely to feel snappier in terms of its response, especially when you get over a couple hundred devices in the network. While we're on the topic of a sensor's response time, there are a few things you can do to help your sensors perform better. Each multi-sensor that you purchase is great for your automations from the standpoint of getting extra information and being able to use that, but it can slow down the response time of the sensor on things that you want brought back immediately. I've seen this with multi-sensors that are trying to sense things like motion 
as well as a number of other things. And then seeing that motion response take extra time. It's not always the case, but watch for it when you get three to four sensors in one device. It can help to have an option to plug in your sensor as this can remove restrictions on how often a sensor can report back to the hub. This would mean a Wi-Fi plug-in sensor could be as good as a battery sensor of another type. Now, many sensors today have pretty specific mounting requirements, and this is especially true with motion sensors that often say they have to be around seven feet or higher in order to properly catch motion. So check out mounting requirements and follow religiously, or it just might not work right. Smart home cameras are a type of sensor, and a lot of them even include a PIR motion sensor. That's exciting, but often these are doing a lot of processing. So it's just going to be too slow in most cases to automate with. So don't use cameras and instead use a motion sensor to capture movement. Which brings me to a couple of tips with motion sensors themselves. Although there are actually a lot of different kinds of motion sensors that could be sold today, the most often one is a PIR sensor. PIR means passive infrared, and these sensors use two or more pyroelectric sensors to detect changes in infrared energy, or really heat. Basically, a thin film on the device produces an electrical current when something emits IR radiation around the sensor. Then the two or more sensors are compared, and when changes are detected in IR radiation, that means there's movement in the space. So what you should hear is that it's not really detecting your movement so much as changes in heat. I get comments all the time about false positives with motion sensors. So here are a number of ways this could be happening. Number one, I already talked about voltage and you really gotta watch those batteries. Number two, anything moving around the sensor quickly could bring heat changes to the sensor. This could include your pets or it could include insects. Number three, this should get you thinking about the air movement in your space potentially blowing right on the device with heated or even cooled air. You could seal the device and that might deal with this issue. Harsh light or just the light from the sun in front of the motion sensor could cause this, could be out in your space as well. So watch out where you're installing the sensor and where the sun is. The field of view and distance ratings of motion sensors are kind of lying to you. The distance that the motion sensor can see is listed in the specifications, but the distance is the maximum that you will find the device effective. And that maximum will be located straight out from the motion sensor. The field of view tells you how far to the sides you can expect the motion sensor to work. But what happens with these two specs combined is that they don't get more powerful like the Power Rangers. Instead, they get less powerful. That's because as you get further out from the center, the distance will shrink considerably. I have seen changes on the order of one third of the distance specification working at that maximum field of view. A lot of people want to use a motion sensor for the wrong application too. And I think given your new understanding of how these devices actually work, you probably won't try to use motion sensors these ways, but just in case. For an outdoor application, you need a specific outdoor motion sensor that deals with a harsh light environments. Still, try to keep your motion sensor away from direct sunlight and some of those false positive situations we just talked about. PIR motion sensors cannot see through glass or won't reliably be able to report. And don't use a motion sensor to determine if someone's in a space. This takes a special or a different kind of motion sensor called a presence sensor or a combination of sensors. Now, with that in mind, a great combination of sensors to determine whether someone has entered a space is a motion sensor combined with a contact sensor. Contact sensors in the smart home are usually a very simple device called a reed switch. It's an electromechanical switch which is basically activated by a magnet coming close, which tells your smart home that the door is closed. And when the magnet moves away, the switch is open and it tells your smart home that the door is open. So basically, the magnet is just pulling two leads together inside of this device. They're just coming together like that. Which should tell you that if you ever lose this smaller part of a contact sensor, 
you could just replace it with another magnet. It's also the case that if you don't like the other half of the contact sensor, or it's not fitting your location, then just get a different magnet. Even more exciting is that one of the key specifications for contact sensors is the distance that the reed switch will activate. You can therefore modify that distance by getting a stronger or a weaker magnet to work with your contact sensor. This is all leading to you understanding that a contact sensor is one of the most versatile devices in your home. They aren't just for doors, although that's often how they are marketed, as you can put them on cabinets and windows and handles and closets. And my favorite use of these is to protect larger valuables like televisions or even protect drawers from the inside. In any case, all you have to do is make sure that the two parts split apart and that you'll get a notification when it does that. On windows, this can be useful to tell you when a window is open and you can combine that with your thermostat to keep your HVAC from running when one or all of the windows are open. Or you can use it for window break detection if you place one of the halves on the window itself. Just be careful to make sure that there's enough distance between the two halves so that when the window is someday sadly broken, they don't end up connecting and instead it falls. Now, a very common use for this type of sensor is to put it on a garage door with a latch on one half of the device. That means the latch will fall as the door moves, which would then give you an open status. When you look at buying a contact sensor though, there is sometimes a feature that significantly extends its usefulness. You will see some say that they can be used as a relay. And when you find that, you can attach a couple of cables to that sensor and then connect another type of sensor or a device that provides a circuit. A good example of this is that I took this contact sensor from AOTech. I connected a weight sensor or a pressure mat and then placed it under my couch. This allowed me to know whenever I was sitting on the couch or someone else was, and there are all kinds of applications like this that you could create very easily. Now let's take a moment and create a bit of a resource as a community. When I create these kinds of tips and tricks videos, it's always great to see how you automators are using your sensors. And I would love for you to write that in the comments, what the best application you found for a motion or a contact sensor in your home. This will help many others watching right now do the same thing. Plus, it might help me create a part two with some of your best ideas. Now, speaking of which, Here's a great list of the different type of sensors that you can find on the market today. And I'm sure there are more, but let's get into some of those other types of sensors that can really help you improve your automations. A vibration sensor is pretty versatile as well. Now this isn't a, a vibration sensor, but there are a number of versions available to purchase today, and they all detect vibrations at different levels of vibration. Now, vibration sensors are generally based on a piezoelectric accelerometer, which really is to say that they will sense acceleration of change in speed in many directions. Most vibration sensors available today will sense movement in all directions, but if you're expecting a sensor to work in a location and it's not, turn it 90 degrees or even at another angle. It still might not work because the vibration might not be powerful enough, but at least this gives you a shot. This can happen when they're using a reed switch inside of the sensor which only moves in a certain way to make contact. The more you know, hey? Now, great applications for a vibration sensor are as a door knocker application, or to sense if something has moved. They can also tell you if your furnace is on when placed on the vents or on the furnace itself. And I've even used Samsung's original contact or multi-purpose sensor to do that. They can tell you if an appliance is running, but I would suggest that you combine that with a power monitoring smart plug that can handle the high amperage and heat of a situation like that. Which I think is really key when we talk about sensors, that we talk about energy monitoring smart plugs or smart power bars. These are often really good to combine with your other types of sensors to get a really clear set of conditions that make your automations really powerful. 
Do you need some examples? The power going high on your TV and someone is sitting on your couch, you know it's TV time. The reverse is true too, as the TV turning off and someone getting off the couch is indicative of TV time being done. Your computer was turned on and a contact sensor shows the door is closed. It could be meeting time. Now, your dryer just went off and the motion sensor in your laundry room saw someone come in, tell them to empty it and tell the rest of your home that they don't need to empty the laundry. Temperature sensors and humidity sensors hide in all kinds of multi-purpose sensors, but you can buy them individually as well. They are useful to tell you when your home has leaks or air gaps, as you will see both an ambient temperature change outside coincide with a change around a window or around a door. You can do comparisons between all of your temperature and humidity sensors to see which are the most extreme issues for heating and cooling your home. Now we've already talked about battery power, but these devices have a direct trade-off in battery life versus reporting frequency. And the same holds true with lighting or luminosity and other sensors that could be reporting less frequently. Now some of the products you already have in your home already have a sensor on them that you could use and you might not expect it. So here are some of the hidden sensors you have in your home. Amazon is known for tucking numerous sensors into their speakers and smart displays. The smart displays can use their cameras and an onboard ultrasonic sensor to determine occupancy. It's not perfect by any means and neither is the ultrasonic sensor being used to determine if you're in the room around an echo or an echo dot. Those have them as well. Your echo also has a temperature sensor on it and that becomes one of the only temperature sensors you can use to start routines inside of Amazon's app, at least today. The occupancy uh, can also be used to start routines with. Amazon also sells an air quality monitor that didn't start out very good because of the options and the features it had on its day of release. However, today, if you're trying to automate in Amazon's Miss A app, you will find that this is one of the most beneficial sensors to have there. Google has also stuck a few sensors into their products and obviously their Nest thermostat has a temperature sensor on it that drives some of the behavior there. However, the Google Nest Hub second generation has radar on it and that can give you information about your sleep cycles. Sadly, Google doesn't let us run automations off any sensor today, but that is stated to change with the matter standard coming. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to get all of your automations and all of the systems you have in your home to play nicely together. This is especially true with sensors because they tend to only work within one hub. Although again, that should start to change with the upcoming matter standard. It is likely that today you have a sensor in one system that you would like to start an automation in another with. There are a few ways to do this specifically within each hub or app, but what I will tell you is that light bulb or light switches or smart plugs or any of those simple on off devices could be used to signify that the sensor has seen something in your hub. Then what you would do is in hub number two or system number two that you would like to automate something within there based on this sensor, you would start an automation based off of this smart plug being turned on. Today I'm going to give you one bonus tip and that is to watch our Smart Home Hubs 101 video which is up on screen now. It will show you how to get much more out of these sensors by pairing them with the right hubs and by organizing your smart home in the right way. Otherwise, thanks for watching today and of course, don't hate, automate.